actual contribution of Professor Jackie Mason, who was the Professor of Forensic Medicine in this university in the 70s and early 80s, and then he became an honorary fellow in law uh, thereafter. Um, and in the spirit of trying to honour his contribution, we want to make sure that these annual lectures actually reflect the, the, the kinds of work and interest that he had. And one area in which uh, Ken had considerable interest was with respect to reproductive rights. So for example, his 2007 book, The Trouble of Pregnancy, explored many, many different aspects of the ethics, law and commerciality of, of, of pregnancy. And that's one of the reasons why we um, picked our topic and our speaker this evening. Um, our speaker is Francoise Bayless, who is the Canadian uh, Research Chair in Bioethics and Philosophy at Dalhousie University in Canada. Francoise's work contributes to public life at the very intersection of policy and practice, and that's what we try to emulate here in the Mason Institute. Um, her publications range very, very widely over things such as research involving children, genetic technologies, embryo research, and women's health. Um, Francoise really is the public intellectual for the modern age. Her personal mantra is to make the powerful care. Um, and tonight, we're delighted uh, that Francoise has agreed to give this annual lecture. Her topic for this evening is baby making the harms of commercial contract pregnancy. Francois, thank you very much. Well, good evening and thank you for coming. I uh, want to start by saying that it's a real pleasure to be here given the weather I left at home. I'm, without exaggeration, the snow is as high as this desk and uh, we've got about five or six inches of ice at the bottom of all that and so in the places where you get to walk and it's clear and everything is quite dangerous. Um, so the rain here seems perfectly lovely. Um, I also want to say it's really a great honour to have been invited to give this lecture. I did uh, a little bit of research as one might expect to understand the main lecture and was really quite impressed by the diversity and uh, of work that uh, Professor Mason had uh, have, you know, completed and accomplished. Uh, and it's really very impressive. So it's quite an honour and thank you for that. The work I'm going to share with you today is work that's in transition, and so part of it is based on a chapter for a book uh, that has just recently come out with a colleague of mine, Carolyn McLeod, and the book is called Family Making because we really wanted to draw attention to something that we think is pervasive as a problem with the reproductive technologies, which is that too often we lose sight of the fact that the project was to make a family, and we tend to then focus on the making of a baby. Um, and I think in many respects, for us, this is what uh, transforms some of those interactions uh, in ways that really have us concerned about commercialization and commodification, because in the abstract, building a family is a very powerful, important thing that one would want to support. Um, we're not so sure that that's always true with respect to the project of baby making. So today what I want to do is speak very specifically about one of the ways in which we go about making a baby. Um, and I refer to that as transnational commercial contract pregnancy for reasons that I'll explain in a minute. So just to give you a brief overview of what I hope to do today, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some background information that I think is relevant uh, in terms of the project. Uh, and then I'm going to move on to focus largely on two broad categories of harm, which really inform my view that what's happening is deeply problematic. I think that you'll see that a lot of the claims I'll make in the first category, the harms to women, are not particularly novel. I hope I brought those concerns together in a way that's powerful uh, in terms of impact, but I'm not saying anything that's particularly new. I think with respect to the kinds of concerns that I want to raise about the harms to children, that there is in fact a new and therefore controversial contribution to the literature, and I want to share with you what I think those harms are. And together, I want to say that those broad categories of harm inform my conclusion that we ought not to be practicing uh, contract pregnancy in the way that we are. And the way that we are practicing that is uh, by allowing uh, new trade to develop outside of our borders. And I say our borders in the following context. One of the things that uh, is in common between the UK and Canada is that we have a prohibition in law with respect to commercial transactions that involve contract pregnancy. We both have legislation, however, that allows for there to be reimbursement for the practice. 
And as a result of those two pieces of legislation, what we see is that within our respective countries, there is demand for this intervention that outstrips supply, and that therefore has led to travel in order to pursue this project. The conclusion that I'm going to try to defend, and I hope that I take you there with me, is that we should not be exporting exploitation. And I think that that's the net effect of current practices, both in my country and here. So what I'm going to try to argue for at the end, and that'll be very quick, um, is that if you have legislation, which in some sense is grounded in the belief that this is not a practice that you want to endorse in your own country, and if you then follow from that, that you want therefore not to be exporting exploitation, what follows is that you ought to be thinking very seriously about the extraterritorial application of your own legislation. And that's the part that's controversial. So let me just say a couple of words of background information. I use the term contract pregnancy in preference to the term surrogacy. I sometimes slip up because, of course, the more common term is in fact surrogacy. But I follow a number of other feminist scholars who argue that the problem with that language is it makes of the woman who is in fact a real mother in all meaningful senses of the word into a passing, transient contributor to someone else's project. She is named, therefore, the surrogate. And I think that that's deeply problematic in and of itself. If you look at the literature, there are two broad kinds of contract pregnancy. One of them involves the technology of artificial insemination, and that means that the woman who is providing the gestational services is also making a genetic contribution to the offspring. We then have another category of contract pregnancy, which uses different technology, in vitro fertilization and embryo transfer. And in that context, the woman who provides the gestational services makes no genetic contribution. The cases I'm going to be talking about today are in that second category, using in vitro fertilization and embryo transfer. And so the woman who's involved as a gestational carrier makes no genetic contribution. And here, when I say that, it's really just to be specific. It's not to undermine that I think the gestational contribution is very, very significant, both in terms of the labor for the woman, but also in terms of the health and well-being of the offspring. If you have any understanding of epigenetics, you understand that the environment is an important contributing factor. I'm not going to emphasize that today. It is just to say that this is not about, uh, in any way, uh, undermining the biological contribution that the woman who will be pregnant is making uh, to the offspring. So the next thing that I want to just also emphasize is the language I've chosen with respect to transnational and with respect to the emphasis then on commercial. I use the term transnational instead of the more familiar term uh, reproductive tourism or cross-border reproductive care. And the reason for that is, first of all, it's not always clear to me that tourism is involved. I think tourism is in fact a subset of the transnational trade, and that's in a context where some jurisdictions truly are selling a holiday at the same time. So my mother is Bajan, she's from Barbados, and in Barbados, where they advertise this service, they truly do mean for you to come and spend a week on the beach while you're getting yourself inseminated or getting artificial uh, services of another kind. Um, but that's not true of many other kinds of businesses around fertility, and therefore I think to talk about it as reproductive tourism is in many cases inaccurate. I also don't use the language of cross-border care, and the reason I don't use that is because it's not always clear to me that there is care involved, and one therefore needs to problematize that language. But also, it becomes important which borders you are crossing. So in my country, there's very big differences between certain provinces. If you look at Australia, there are very big differences between various states. If you look at the United States, there are very big differences, again, between the different states. And so it isn't just cross-border that I'm looking at. I really am looking at many of those cases, countries still having some overarching kinds of legislation, and therefore really talking about transnational. In that context, we have buyers and sellers. And what I hope you recognize is that the buyers basically, at the end of the day, come from everywhere and anywhere. So those countries are captured by those continents. When you look at the sellers, however, there are in fact some important differences and there are specific countries that become destinations of choice. And I think what you'll see with all of these countries, with the exception of the United States, and I've not put them on the list because as a country they're not necessarily a destination point, though some specific states, especially California, definitely are destination for this kind of service, what you're looking at are places where you can expect to find impoverished 
and poorly educated women who would provide the service, and by and large, that is the subset, that socioeconomic group that is targeted within those countries. So why is it that people travel? They travel for myriad reasons, and the list I've put up there is really illustrative. It is not comprehensive. There are other things I could suggest. But really what you find more often than not is that the sending country, if you will, in some senses has some kind of a prohibitive regime. And even though the UK, Canada, other places allow for reimbursement, they don't allow for the contractual arrangement where there's an overpayment for services rendered, and I'm putting that generally under a prohibitive regime because I'm drawing a distinction between prohibitive and restrictive, and the restrictive regime is really where you can't meet certain eligibility criteria. So for example, you must be married, or for example, you must be a heterosexual couple. So these are con contexts in which it would otherwise be available to you for the activity itself is not prohibitive, but it is in fact only available to a subset of the population. There is the question of availability. I already made a comment about supply and demand. Uh, especially in a context where you do have constraints on who can provide the service. We have people that are looking for specific genetic material, and so they perhaps don't find that to be particularly available to them, and they find that in the country that they are going to. There are issues around cost, the expense of this, and that can vary tremendously in certain countries. And also, most importantly, many of the people who are amongst the buyers actually identify the fact that they like traveling because it puts a huge distance between themselves and the gestational carrier, which means that that person is unlikely to be in their backyard demanding or asking for access to the child that they have birthed. And so they're quite happy with the idea that this person will be far away from their family. So that's a little bit of the background uh, situation in this kind of context, which then takes us to look at why is it that we have the current phenomena. And what I'm going to do for the purposes of today's conversation is I'm actually going to restrict it to one country. I'm going to look at India. Why? Because it is a destination of choice at the present time, though things have changed recently with certain decisions that have been made in that country. But what happens is many of the arguments that I want to make, because I want them to be grounded in facts, it becomes much easier to look at one place. It's not that I couldn't do this with another country, it's just I don't want there to be sweeping statements which someone would then turn around and say, well, that's not true, here's an exception. Um, and in you know, many cases, I do think you need to make different kinds of claims in order to advance the concern I want to advance with respect to exploitation. So what are some of the facts about India? Generally speaking, labor is cheap. The doctors, meanwhile, are highly qualified, so they have a very good medical system, which is something that you want in the context of paying for the services. English is spoken throughout the country, not always true with respect to some of the rural centers that we'll talk about, but in terms of the people with whom you would be interacting with in terms of setting up the contract, etc., you won't have any particular problems. They have a practice of keeping the nine women, the, sorry, the women for the nine months, um, in what gets called uh, a hostel, which is sort of a nice euphemism for a place where they are expected to stay uh, for the nine months. And that's <coughs> seen by some as a benefit. Uh, sometimes it's seen by, as a benefit by the couple or the individual who is contracting for the services because it means there's the possibility of control. You know exactly what they're eating, you know if they're taking their vitamins, you know if they're getting exercise, etc. It's also been presented as a benefit because while they're there, they will get education, they'll get access to computers, etc. And for some people, most importantly, they will avoid the stigma in their home community where slowly they become pregnant, eventually they give birth, and then ultimately they give the baby away. Whereas in this case, they're able to return to their rural communities and tell a story about how they were in the urban center as a housekeeper, for example. So arguably, there's an interest in doing this from both parties, but for the commissioning or the intending parents, uh, there's a, a, a possibility of oversight and control. And that happens uh, in that country, not necessarily in other countries. And another very important thing that I will talk about at length again is they have a legal structure which makes it such that the intending parents are the people named on the birth certificate. And this becomes very important in terms of issue uh, with respect to legal parentage and with respect to citizenship. 
and that is not the case in many other countries. So in many other countries, the woman who gives birth will be the person on the birth certificate, and the person to whom she's married, if she is married, regardless of having made no genetic contribution, will be identified um, as the father. So this again becomes something that is attractive to people who are buying the service. Beyond that, I think it's really important to look at the costs that are involved. And depending on who you cite, you can find references to the overall cost in the UK, and this is in the context of reimbursing for expenses, as being between seven and 15,000 pounds. And if I'm wrong about that, I'm happy to be corrected. I'm relying there really on having read, you know, sort of academic and media reports about what are the current costs here in the UK, as I said, in the context of reimbursing uh, for expenses and time lost. If you look at the cost in India, you could say that to the couple it's comparable in some sense, that is the purchasers. Um, and one of the things that I think is striking to put out there for you is really what percentage of that money goes to the individual woman. And I think that's what becomes a stark contrast because at least in theory in the UK, that amount is going to the woman who's providing the services. That's considerably different in the Indian context. But moreover, the actual cost could be a lot higher, and according to uh, the work that I've been able to access, if you look at the agency fees, if you look at the travel to and from India, if you look at lawyers' fees, etc., it can apparently get as high as £70,000. So this is a context in which it would be a lot cheaper to do it, if you could, in the United Kingdom, but the problem is because you're not allowed legally to pay for this service, you in fact don't have a whole lot of women lining up beating down the doors to provide the service, and so many people are concerned that they would have to wait for a very long time and they'd rather spend the money than spend the time, quite frankly, waiting for this. And so in that context, what you see is a fair bit of movement. Now the last point that I put up there, which really is the point that I want to emphasize, and this is why I focused on India with respect to my comments about exploitation, because India is unique in this regard, which is that the government has invested in this activity. The government has made it easy for this to develop and flourish as a way of earning a living or making money. Um, and they've done that in a variety of ways. They actually have an Indian Medical Travel Association, so they actually got infrastructure set up to attract people to the country. Not just for this, but for all kinds of medical travel, so this is seen to be an important contribution to their GDP. You also have a government that gives low interest rate loans for people who are setting up these kinds of private institutions catering to foreign patients. They have eligibility for low import duties in terms of bringing in any kind of equipment that they would need. They get tax breaks from their hospitals, so the infrastructure, the institution, and they have special visas. Now again, it's just a sampling, but it's meant to say that this is something that is actively supported by the government. So this is not something that's happening in any kind of a black or a gray market. This is upfront seen to be a way of allowing a part of their population to be legitimately employed, and the government is actively making that easier for them. So that's the background information I wanted to share with you. And now what I want to do is I want to build two arguments. Um, they're going to be relatively quick, and I invite you at the end to challenge me. But I'm going to make the argument that this is harmful to women, and I'm going to emphasize that it's harmful in the context of exploitation. And then secondly, I'm going to make the claim that it's harmful to the children, and I'm going to make this in the context of identity formation. So the comments about exploitation can really be summarized in this way. I think the whole industry is premised on the ability to take advantage of certain social, material, and political conditions which set up clear power dynamics between the buyer and the seller. I think ultimately then this reinforces socially unacceptable structural injustices, and that's why I made the references in the background facts to the way in which the government supports these activities. And basically what you have there, thereby is a government that says, here's a way that you can get yourself out of poverty. And I'm saying, that's not the government's job. It's actually not your job to increase the number of exploitative practices that are available to your population. What you ought to be doing is in fact changing the background conditions such that people have reasonable choices for employment. And the other thing that I think becomes really important, and I hope that I can show this, is that this activity not only harms the individual women who participate, but in fact it harms women as a class in terms of reinforcing the kind of work that seemed to be appropriate, legitimate, available, and therefore if you're poor, it's your problem because we've given you opportunities, ways in which you can in fact pull yourself and your family 
out of poverty. And I think that that's deeply problematic. Now, having said that, people disagree with me. So, one of the things that you will find is many people saying back, look, it's a mutually advantageous exchange. This is not exploitation. And in that context, you will see these types of quotes that I've put up there. So the first one is from an Indian woman, and she says really clearly, this is not exploitation, but this is contract pregnancy. Crushing glass, which is the alternative employment that she would have had, for 15 hours a day, now that's exploitation, she says. The baby's parents have given me a chance to make a good marriage for my daughters. Now, importantly, dowries are in fact illegal. But in this context, what's being said very clearly is that it is allowing me to do well by my children. We give them a baby, they give us much needed money, it's good for them and for us. And again, the underlying claim is we're not being exploited, we're making a choice, and this is a good exchange in the grand scheme of things, given the capitalist options available to us. The last quote is actually from one of the buyers, it happens to be a Canadian woman, and she says they're doing something that's good. In their eyes, they don't feel exploited. And I find it's really interesting here speaking for another, but those are the kinds of comments that you will see, and it's in this attempt to sort of reframe this as a legitimate exchange that happens in a capitalist world, and this just happens to be around a particular kind of product, i.e. the baby. Now what I want you to be aware of is that in many cases, these are women that are looking for the basics of life. They're looking for housing, looking for food, they're looking for clean water. This is not about you know, any kind of things that are frivolous, though as I said, on that list, and it's why I chose that quote, you also find references to um, the dowry. Now against that, you will have people that will make strong claims about exploitation. Uh, this is the work of Amrita Pande, who has done probably the most um, interesting on-site uh, work with the uh, women involved in this kind of labor. This is her new book, it's just come out. The quote that I have is not from that book, but I encourage you to read the book. And in that context, what is interesting is that many people, including um, Amrita, and including Sama, and some of the Indian feminist intellectuals, are actually arguing for uh, this kind of work, contract pregnancy, to be treated in the same way that other sex work is treated. And so they are arguing that this should be seen as labor, and in fact, the state should get involved in the way that we would with any other kind of legitimate form of labor. We should have fair wages, we should have workers' compensation, we should pay taxes, etc. So Amrita and others make that kind of argument, but they do that in the context of saying, we have to listen to what these women are saying, and they are saying that they're being exploited, but here's a way of addressing that exploitation. It's about changing the working conditions. Um, in that context, though, I want to look at it slightly differently, and here I'm looking and using as a base uh, work done by a colleague here in the UK, Stephen Wilkinson, who has a book out. Uh, it's an old book now, but has since you know, continued to write along this vein, and so holds similar views to this day. But in this book, he actually looks at exploitation and looks at it in two different kinds of ways and argues that we can have something called wrongful exploitation um, or we can have unfair advantage exploitation. Now, my own perspective is that contract pregnancy fits both of these kinds of exploitation, but in fact, it's quite hard to make the claim uh, without, in fact, completely taking on capitalism, and I am just not skilled enough to do that. Though I do think at the end of the day that's the problem, is that we've committed to a particular way of organizing the world. And so what I do and will do in this presentation is I'm going to take on the easier task of arguing that it's an instance of unfair advantage exploitation. So what I'm going to try to show in a few slides is that when you look at the distribution of benefit and harm between the contracting parties, you do in fact have an exchange that is fundamentally unjust. And then I'm going to take the second point, which is uh, with respect to the issue of whether or not you have a valid consent, and I'm going to argue that in many, if not most cases, you don't, and you can't. So at least in one sense, I'm going to argue, you do have a clear instance of unfair advantage exploitation, and Wilkinson and others are then going to say back to me, yeah, but we can fix that. Um, and I'm going to call into question whether or not, in fact, you can fix that. So if there is this unfair advantage exploitation, what is it that I can say with respect to the nature of that exchange in terms of the benefits and harms that make it unfair? And what is it that I can say that will confirm or at least engage with the claim that you don't have a valid consent? <laughs> 
So if I look very quickly before I get into the benefits listed here, let me just say on the other hand that the intending parents are going to get a very clear benefit of getting a baby. The real harm that they perhaps are going to incur is that the woman doesn't want to hand over the baby. So the baby will exist in the world, but they actually will not get to parent that. So those are the benefits and harms on their side of the equation. And now I want to look at the potential benefits for the gestational carrier and the potential harms. Now, the major benefit is going to be that they're going to get a wage. And in many cases, I'm going to argue that that's in fact the only benefit that they're going to get. And that's in part what's going to make it unfair advantage exploitation. In that context, the wage paid, I'm going to argue, doesn't in any way, shape, or form compensate for the medical and psychological harms that will come as a result of participating in this activity. But more importantly, in the context of exploitation, it's exactly because of that that it's an attractive destination point. People who choose to go to India and choose to try to purchase this are in fact attempting to secure an advantage because of that gap. Um, otherwise, they would just stay in England or locally and do that. Scotland, I should say given that I'm here. Um, but what I want to say is, the reason I'm saying that there's only a wage and I'm emphasizing that, is that there are other benefits of contract pregnancy in other countries, and I'm taking the U.S. as an example because it's another place where you can, in fact, purchase this. Um, the woman, while she's pregnant, she can actually do other things. She's not expected to sit in a hostel in a bed for nine months. She can actually have health care independent of and that means prior to and after she has rendered this service. Whereas these women basically get access to health care for nine months, and that's it. You leave, doesn't matter what your complications are afterwards. Um, they're going to have money for travel, for dietary needs, etc. These women are not given anything like that. They're just fed, arguably, while we're there. Um, but that, in some senses, raises some other interesting questions because, again, that particular benefit disappears after the nine months. Um, and I would say to you that, again, if I were to emphasize the epigenetic contributions of pregnancy, it really matters not what just the genetic material is, but the woman in whom this genetic material is transferred. It's actually often being transferred to a body that has been starved for a very long time. And so people think that they're taking care of that by feeding them very well for nine months, um, but they haven't, in fact, really attended to that. They don't get independent legal representation. The lawyers are for the clients that are coming forward and they are asked to sign a contract. Often a contract they cannot read. If you look at this in many cases, it's not available to them in their native tongue, their language. It's in English. And some of these women, despite the fact that in India many people speak English, they do not. And you actually have contracts that are signed with a thumbprint. Many of them afterwards learn of many features that they have signed for. One of the things that's very telling, and you get a lot of this in Pandey's book, is, for example, they have invariably signed that they will have a cesarean section. And the reason the couples want this is to make sure that they can organize their travel to be there for the birth, but they also don't want there to be anything to go wrong during the birthing process, so this woman, who has in many ways been treated as a vessel, will be cut open and have the baby removed. And these are women who have had children, and many of them anticipate or think that they're going to have a natural delivery, and that choice, too, is taken away from them. But that's something that they will have contractually agreed to, not understanding it. And that's really clear from a number of the interviews with these women. There are no post-birth opt-out clauses, which is what you find in North America, such that the women can, up until a certain moment in time, change their mind, even though they have agreed to hand over the child. And the other thing that's really clear is that there is, in North America, at least the potential for an ongoing relationship. So depending on the nature of that exchange, you may have said that you will have some kind of distant, but at least present role in that new family that you helped to create. So this is to say that there are many things that could be benefits other than a wage if you were trying to say we're going to get a fair exchange, um, and yet none of this is on offer in the context of what goes on in India. That's why some people, like Kande, will say, look, it's exploitative right now, but we could make it better such that it wasn't exploitation, such that people really were engaged in something that was mutually advantageous. But for it to be genuinely mutually advantageous, there has to be respect. There has to not be this attempt to take advantage of another, or to take advantage of the circumstances within which another finds herself. And I think that's one of the things that's really important here.
Let me just put this into context for you. I showed you early on that for these nine months, the women themselves might make between about 550 pounds and about tenfold that. I think it was up to about 6,500 pounds. To put that in context, the annual salary um, in at least rural areas is about 240 pounds. Okay, so if you're at the low end of the spectrum, you still made more money than you could make in any other kind of job by almost doubling your salary, okay? But if you're at the higher end of that, at 6,500 pounds compared to 240 pounds annually in a rural area, it's a windfall, right? It's a major incentive. And again, you have to remember the people who are being approached are looking for the necessaries of life by and large. Let me then just say one of the potential medical harms that I want to emphasize. Well, first of all, you're going to have all of the risks that come with in vitro fertilization. But beyond that, you're going to have imposed risks because of the ways in which you're not going to be able, in fact, to control the pregnancy. Some of the contracts require that you terminate pregnancies in the event that there's some kind of a fetal anomaly. And again, sometimes they don't understand that. Sometimes they're required to undergo fetal reduction, and that's because generally the women consent to have three, sometimes more, embryos transferred, which means you could end up, in theory, with a pregnancy that's carrying triplets or at least twins, and so they will then require of the woman to reduce that pregnancy because the contracting couple might take twins, but they really don't want triplets, and some of them don't even want twins. You can be required to undergo a termination, you can be required to undergo a cesarean section, and the bottom line is you will have no follow-up medical care, and so this again means that you're going to be incurring medical risks that you may not um, have anticipated. One of the things that's absolutely true and well documented is that even some of the women who makes money at the higher end of that spectrum, the money is gone very shortly thereafter, which is why they then come back and do another round. Uh, according to Indian law, you can be uh, involved as a gestational carrier up to three times, and so some of the women will do that. And then when they've exhausted their three times, they might turn to their daughters or their sisters or others and encourage them to do that because the poverty is not only experienced as an individual, the poverty is experienced communally as a family or broader than that. And so there's an incentive to try to pull yourself out of poverty through spreading the wealth in some sense. And then there are the potential psychological harms, at least the ones that I think most people um, would anticipate. And one of the things that I think is particularly interesting there is those who disagree with me will say, well, we can address some of these, um, but I'm not sure how. So I, I understand how you might be able to address some of the medical harms, right? And that would be, in fact, giving women choices and providing them with appropriate care. But these kinds of uh, psychological harms, it seems to me that they, they are you know, personal. They're a function of the individual, and it's not clear to me how you would address that. So I'm going to say that when I look at who's getting the benefits and who's getting the harms, it seems pretty clear to me that this is an unfair exchange uh, in terms of the, the benefits and harms available to the two contracting parties. Now remember, the second thing I needed to show was that there wasn't a valid consent. And now, on the one hand, you'll have many people who are going to push back and say, of course there's free choice, and not only is it free choice in the abstract, it's in a win-win situation. And think back to those quotes, right? We get a baby, they get money, we're all getting what we want, and in this world, that's a great exchange. Um, I don't think so. I don't actually see those contracts as expressions of free choice. And I think the people that say that really have a very strong, liberal ideal of who individuals are out there in the world as independent, rational beings contracting out for what they need. Uh, and my view of us is that we're much more social and embedded and relational. And in that context, we don't just make rational choices out of self-interest. We, in fact, are participating in a number of other kinds of ways of understanding our place in the world. And so I'm suggesting, in fact, that the consent is invalid. Why? Because what's on offer is the basic necessities of life, and one ought not to have to trade one's body to get access to those. Okay? And I think in that context, it's pretty clear that if what you're trying to do is put a roof over your head and food in your mouth, it's kind of hard to think about that as sort of a free exchange as I'm sitting there making a rational choice. Right? Um, that isn't to say that you don't have any agency. It's not to say that you cannot say, hmm, start or become you know, a gestational carrier. I do think women are capable of making that choice. And I can imagine that it's a very intelligent choice to make given your circumstances, but I'm saying the circumstances are unfair. It's not a context in which that becomes a real or a meaningful choice, not when you're looking at the necessities of life. 
So in that context, I think one really ought to question uh, the assumption that you have um, a valid consent. And I just wanted to put up here for you a statement that I think really underscores that, that we're really not looking um, at autonomous decision making in this kind of context. Why? Because you're looking at people that really are experiencing dire economic straits. They're in a context where, as I've said now a couple of times, uh, they're not looking for frills. Uh, they're really looking at basic needs. <coughs> So what am I saying at the end of the day? I think you're looking at structural injustice. You're looking at the fact that you have a very strong case system still in India. You have limited access to education, and I have a number of you know, stats about that showing that by and large you're looking at people that have between a grade seven and a grade 12 education um, in terms of, you know, therefore what are going to be their other options in the marketplace. They are already marginalized in that context, and they're already living in patriarchal structures. So very often, in the narrative of these women, they say, well, look, that's fine for you to say something, but you don't have a drunk husband who's not working, right? Um, and you also find that in many cases, some of these men are actually actively involved in pushing uh, their partners to present themselves voluntarily for this kind of work. And so I think it's really important to call that um, into question. Beyond that, I've already said, and I just want to emphasize that you have a government that is actively putting this forward as a reasonable way to pull yourself out of poverty. And in that context, I think that all I can say, again, is that's not the business of government. It's not to, you know, multiply the number of exploitative opportunities for its people. It's, in fact, to attend to the poverty in ways that then allow people to make important choices for themselves. Let me transition now and then just talk very briefly about the harms to children. These are some uh, you know, pretty dramatic cases that I've put up images for. The first one in the foreground is uh, Baby Manji, and the problem there was a Japanese couple that uh, went to India to have a baby, and there were problems with respect to legal parentage and citizenship, and in the end, the grandmother has to come from Japan to adopt the baby, bring them home, and that's because the original couple that contracted for the pregnancy had a divorce, and the woman who had no genetic link to this child didn't want the child in the context of that family situation. The other one is Baby Gami, and that was a case that involved uh, Thailand and Australian couple. The, the woman is from Thailand, and the couple had twins, and Baby Gami had Down syndrome, and they didn't want that baby, so they came and they picked up the other twin and left Baby Gami behind. And the last case is a same-sex couple that had a child uh, from a woman in Russia, and apparently, according to the court documents, within about six weeks of the child's birth, uh, were actively sexually abusing the child and lending him out. And that raised a number of questions about this practice and how are you not, in fact, involved in trafficking, when all you have to do is find somebody who's willing to, in fact, become a human producer of a product that you then use in this kind of way. So those, I think, are pretty discreet and obvious kinds of harms to children. But I do want to say that they are, in the grand scheme of things, anomalous. It is not the case that these are the sort of everyday kinds of stories. In fact, these are the ones that make the news because they are, in fact, at the horrific end of the spectrum. So when I make the claim that there are harms to children, I really want to ground it in what is going to be true for the majority. So the harms to children that I then choose to emphasize have to do with this nebulous thing called identity formation. In that context, one of the things I wanted to show, which I think is actually quite telling, is there's a picture of Bob Edwards, of Edwards and Steptoe, who in fact is famous for having created the first test tube baby, Louise Brown, and yet look at what he says in 1974, and I put the year up there because that's before we have the first success with IVF, and here's someone who clearly understands at least the biology of what he was doing, and yet he's able to say, and I'm quoting him, that these children born of contract pregnancy what might they suffer on learning the circumstances of their birth? So he's actually aware of this. And the reason I also put this up here is because it's 40 plus years later and we've done no research and paid no attention to what might be the consequences for the children who are born out of this unusual way of making babies. And so I think you have a call from the very beginning before we're actually successful at doing the technological tinkering to say we can anticipate harms. And we've actually turned a blind eye. And I think we've actively turned a blind eye. Why? Because it's become about baby making and it's become about getting access to this very valuable, quote unquote, 
product, and we don't want to tell ourselves that what we're doing is harmful to these children. So what I'm going to try to show, very quickly you'll appreciate, is that there's three broad categories under which I think there can be damaging effects on identity formation. One of them I lump generally under lack of access to genetic data, and I'm using genetic data there as a catch-all for something more than just DNA. It's about genetic information, it's about the personal information that goes with that genetic information, and in many cases it's right down to contact information. I'm also going to say that there are the harms of stigmatization in this particular context, not only because you don't know your biological relatives, but because as an adolescent or older, you might actually come to believe that you're the product of exploitation. And that might actually not make you feel so good about yourself. And one of the things that we find is interesting is that there's starting to be a literature about this issue in a different context. For example, children who find out that their parents were Nazis, or children who find out that their parents were slave owners, or their grandparents were slave owners, or that they come in some kind of lineage, where they actually start having questions about who they are relative to where they come from. So I'm not saying that I know that this applies here. I'm saying that this is the kind of thinking that has had me ask questions about this. And then I think in that context, you might also start to think of yourself as a product. And what does that mean for your sense of self, for your psychic well-being? The last thing I'll touch on very quickly then is also uncertain legal parentage and nationality because people often feel very proud about where they come from. They do seem to have a sense of allegiance and it's a big deal to give up your citizenship, for example. And so what happens to people that don't have a good sense of what that is in a particular kind of context? So all of this, I think, can be very harmful to people. Now, having said that, before I make those claims in great depth, I do want to share with you what I think I understand by identity because, in fact, many people will make this claim, but they don't actually then tell you what they think identity is. I'm very much nesting this in literature about narrative identity, which basically is making the claim in a very short way that you are the story that you can tell about who you are and the story that other people will accept and instantiate. And if you think about it in those terms, one of the important things about identity is that it's dynamic, right? It doesn't change. You aren't you cast in stone, right? You are you constantly evolving, and that becomes important here. These are just some quotes from scholars in the area that work in this context of narrative identity, and they're really talking about an autobiography. You see that in the work of Mariah Sheckman, and in the work of Hilda Nelson, what you really get is this broader claim about it being about a web. It's not just you and your story, it's you and your story and how it intersects with everybody else's story, including your parents, your siblings, your friends, your employer, etc., and how in some sense they all shape who you are and who you can be. So basically, if I can, I think it gets reframed for me as the following, that persons are constituted in and through their personal relationships, their public interactions, and their ancestry. And in that context, I think it behooves us to think about what happens when you have an extremely unusual origin story. Of course, that presumes you know your origin story, and that becomes important. The other thing, then, is it also fits in with what I said earlier about having sort of a very clear feminist orientation with respect to the concept or notion of person, whereby all persons are embedded and interdependent. In that context, I've offered up a theory of narrative identity in which I try to suggest that it's actually very cyclical. So you have a sense of who you are, that's your self-perception, and you think that you project it out into the world, right? I'm a powerful, exciting, beautiful woman, right? And then the world, in effect, responds to me in ways that either instantiate that claim or rebut it. No, actually, that's what you think, but really? Mm -hmm. Not quite so. And then as I become aware of the fact that you're not reading me in the way that I want to be read, I try again. And I try to do a better job of persuading you of who I am. And over time, I either succeed or I don't. And if I don't, I have to then either think about myself differently or, quite frankly, I'm going to pick up and go. I'm going to find another community of belonging that's willing to sort of reinforce who I am and who I want to be in the world. Now, I've said that in a very sort of overt way, and you'll appreciate it. it doesn't happen in that kind of an overt way. But that's the kind of imagining that I think happens um, in very subtle and unconscious ways as we look to try to belong and as we look to sort of communicate to people who we are and we hope that they embrace us for all the good things that we are, right? We try to hide the not so good things. But we become aware of them. That's our identity. And many, many things will feed into that identity. And basically, the thing that becomes important is up until this point, what I've said is descriptive. That's what I think our identity is. 
and it's complicated, and what I said to you is very simplistic. But the point is that that identity formation, which I said is ongoing and dynamic, can either be positive or negative. I haven't said anything about whether it's good or bad. I just said that's how we are in the world. And so then the question I have to ask in this context is, does this particular kind of origin story get experienced as empowering or debilitating? And in the context that I'm arguing, I'm going to say that it's actually ultimately going to prove to be very damaging. And I could be wrong about that, but that's the claim that I'm trying to defend. I actually think, and these are quotes from a commissioning couple with respect to the child that they have brought, and they say, we're going to tell our child that they're a very special child. They're going to, be, they're going to know that they were made in India in the womb of a stranger with the egg of a Mumbai housewife picked from an internet lineup. The child will know what? That they're unique. They were brought into the world in a very special way. Now these parents think of themselves as doing something really important. They're going to be honest with their child, and that certainly is something that is seen to be positive. But note the assumption is that somehow this is going to be internalized in a very positive way. And I just don't think we can know that. Somebody's going to think that's a really cool story. Let me just go tell everybody, yeah, you know, my parents looked through this catalog, and they found this woman in Mumbai, and they bought this egg, and they really love me. You know, and you say, you know, I cost more than that fancy car that your parents have, you know. Is that how they're going to tell their story? Or are they going to say, yeah, you know, it's kind of pretty disgusting, isn't it? Like, you know, there wasn't any kind of, you know, product of love story that I can tell you. Maybe it's better than a product of rape story, but do we know that it's a good story? I'm suggesting we don't, and I'm suggesting it's quite risky that it's going to be very different. And so I ask that question, will the identity constituting narrative be empowering or damaging, and I'm suggesting that the risk is quite high that it's going to be very damaging, assuming that the person is aware of that. Very quickly, in terms of harms, there are harms that are going to come from genetic data if you're using donor gametes, and that is going to be true in all of the cases in India. You're using genetic material that is coming from someone else. The someone else is different from the woman, but it may be the same as the couple. And that's interesting, that's not always been true. And the reason I say that is up until quite recently, India allowed for um, same-sex couples, and so therefore you definitely would have been using genetic material from outside of that couple. They have recently narrowed it and only allow now for heterosexual married couples, and so that would change. But in that context, you could have imagined scenarios where they would not have had access to information about their genetics, and that that could be problematic uh, in a variety of ways. And the, the fact is that we do have some empirical data from donor-conceived children, so maybe not in the context of contract pregnancy, but they are in fact being quite vocal, saying that they have been harmed. Uh, we have a case in Canada that's gone to the Supreme Court, and it's one of the few cases that has reached that level of court. And in that context, you do in fact see a fair bit of testimony from people coming forward saying that this has not been a good thing for them not to have access to that information. But beyond that, I think the most important harms can perhaps be categorized in terms of stigma. You will not know your biological relatives in some cases. You may come to see yourself as having been birthed by a woman who was exploited. And you may in fact come to see yourself as the object of a contract and a product. And so the question I'm asking myself is what does it mean to come to the realization that you would not exist but for the fact that your parents were willing to exploit some poor woman in another country. What does it mean to be the means to someone else's end? So they really wanted a child, but you didn't exist. So it's not like they really wanted you specifically. They really wanted a child, and they were willing to do what to get this child? And I think it's quite clear that there are different ways in which people might think about that. So what then is the empirical data? Well, interestingly, one of the few places to have done that work is here uh, in the United Kingdom. Most of that work has been done by Susan Gallenbach and her team. And she started a longitudinal study that included 42 families that were created by contract pregnancy. It also included uh, families through natural conception, families through egg donation, etc. But what she's done is she's had the same kind of surveys and questionnaires, and then later on there is some observational studies where she looks at the children that are born. And if I just extract out the data with respect to contract pregnancy, her data shows that at one, two, and three years of age, there's absolutely no difference in the infant's 
temperaments, depending on which kinds of families they come from. And I want to say back, well, that's not surprising. I mean, I don't think they have any concept of their identity, and it's not surprising that, you know, you wouldn't expect to see that. One of the things that is interesting is that when she redoes the work and the children are at age seven, they are showing higher levels of adjustment problems as rated by their mothers. Not by their teachers, interestingly, but as rated by their mothers. And what's interesting is that in the academic work, you actually find the statement that perhaps this could be attributed to the need to struggle with identity issues. So apparently, according to psychological literature, this happens at around age seven when you're trying to figure out where do I come from. And what's interesting is that this research is in a context where some of the women will have been using uh, friends and family members as the gestational carrier, and so they will in fact know who this other person is in their family life, there will be contact, and so that kind of contributed to some of the confusion. Interestingly, at a later time, at around age 10, this uh, confusion appears to go away. But we're really looking at children that are still quite young, which doesn't have any data on adolescence, which is when you really start to engage with identity formation issues. But what I want to point out are the limitations of her studies and why they don't apply to the case that I've been talking about here. So first of all, there's a small sample size. Started off with 42 families down to 33 families. These are 33 families in the UK, and so they're not engaged in transnational contractual arrangements. It's not commercial as uh, we've been talking about. And in many cases, there's ongoing contact between the woman who birthed the child and the child. So 20 out of 33, that's quite high. And most of those children, I think with the exception of one, actually says they quite like their gestational carriers. They've got a positive relationship there. So those are the limitations of that study. But beyond that, what we're starting to see, and this is in a context where up until quite recently, and so this is 2013, when I've been walking around saying, I think there are all these harms about identity, and everybody's been saying, like, no, there's no empirical data to support your claims, Francoise. But what I'm seeing now is in this new literature, we are starting to see some comments that I think are really hinting in this direction. And so this comes out of a 2013 paper, Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry, and the quote is, the absence of a gestational connection to the mother may be more problematic for children than the absence of a genetic link. Now, I don't know if that's going to turn out to be true, but I think that's actually quite interesting, because how much of that will have been about the way that people have been socialized around what is or is not important in terms of birthing. And we have a lot that's already been invested by Gollenbach and her team in saying very clearly, genetics doesn't matter. And yet now that they are seeing this difference in this particular context, they're having to attribute it to something, and so the something may be that there's a difference between having a link with your gestational mother as opposed to your genetic mother. I think it's a bit unusual. I certainly can't explain it at this point, but I put this up here to say that for the first time, we're actually starting to see in robust empirical work some allusion to the fact that there may be something. This is Gollenbach's new book. It's out this year. I put it up here because it's actually a very accessible book, um, and it actually summarizes close to 15 years' worth of research. So all of those academic papers, like the one I just showed you, are actually translated into a very um, clear statement and it's broken down in a way that's interesting, but what do you find, and this is going to be a 2015 publication, what is not yet known is how children born through surrogacy will feel about their origins later in their lives. Okay? So again, we're starting to see that identified as an issue. Again, another quote, it remains to be seen how children will feel as they enter adolescence when issues relating to identity become more significant. All I'm trying to say here is that we don't actually have good data. The data we have expires at about age 10. Gollenbach is the one with the longitudinal study, so she'll keep generating that data. But as I've said to you, that data doesn't even include the complicated scenario of a child who has been purchased. And I want to say that really clearly, and why I want to emphasize that is that in the data that is available coming out of the UK, these children speak very positively about their gestational mothers in the sense that they say, isn't she wonderful? My mummy's tummy was broken and she helped to fix it. So they have a very positive attitude towards that woman. Will they have that same positive attitude when the story is not she was helping my mummy with the broken tummy, but rather she was making a buck, right? And will you have more sympathy for her when you understand the current situations under which she was trying to make some money for her family to be able to feed them and clothe them? You might. And if you have sympathy for her, how will that translate to the feelings that you do or don't have for the people that are raising you? And I can just imagine this in many ways being traumatic. I'm coming to an end. I know I've said a lot, and I'm sure you have some questions, if not challenges.
But this is one of the few comments that we have from somebody who was in fact born of contract pregnancy. And you can see that it's not a very positive kind of scenario. Now when I present that, I'm criticized to say, well, yeah, but you don't have a quote from the other side. It's like, well, I would put it up there. Honestly, I would if I could find it. I have it. And then the criticism comes, well, you know, this is probably just a vocal minority. And the answer is, might be. Maybe all the other people are happy, but I just still can't find those narratives. And beyond that, one of the things that I did find recently is the following, which is actually a Facebook page. I'm a product of surrogacy. And there you can, if you go to the page, you can actually see this is the picture that she's put up of herself um, immediately after her birth. But you can see that she's, she's struggling with trying to figure out um, what kind of story to tell about who she is and where she comes from. And it's not just her story, it's her parents' story. And it's her relationship with her parents in some sense. So lastly, there are the harms to the children in terms of the legal issues. I've already alluded to this in terms of uncertain legal parentage and nationality. And what happens if you're marooned, if you're stateless, if you're parentless? And I know that that sounds rather dramatic, but if I think back to the case of Baby Manji, in the end, he was given sort of a court order that he would be the parent to care for the child, but still not given the right of a parent. And there are just different rules in different countries as to how you get citizenship. And it matters the nationality of your parents, and if there's confusion about who your parents are, it's not clear whether you can get access to nationality. And if you're in a country where you get nationality based on geography, that's fine, but that geography may not be corresponding to where your parents are, especially not in this context. They need to be able to take you out of the country and home to where they live. And so basically, you need to be able to answer questions. And most of the jurisdictions around the world then turn to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. These are the rights that you have in that international convention. And by and large, what that has meant is at the end of the day, the courts do try to do what's in the best interest of the children. And so in the end, they end up violating all of the laws that they have anyways that say you can't do this. Because to insist on those laws would in fact to be to maroon a child, to leave them stateless, to leave them parentless, etc. And so in that context, they try to reconcile that. But it's in a context there where you have other people saying to them, what we're really endorsing is child trafficking. And we just have to be really glad that they don't end up mostly being abused. And so in that context, I think you've got constant tension. These are the kinds of legal questions that you have to be able to answer. And they are the kinds of legal questions that vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And so at the end of the day, I'm coming back to say, when we look at contract pregnancy, I think you clearly are taking advantage of unfortunate, one might go so far as to say, unethical social, material, and political inequalities. You are in fact having to turn a blind eye to the harmful effects on children. And ultimately then, it's because you are unable or unwilling to address your own responsibility for what's happening in the world by virtue of being willing to tolerate these kinds of conditions. The book, cover that you see there is by Margaret Atwood, The Handmaid's Tale, and really it's in a context where we're imagining a future where women ultimately are vessels for other women. And that's what brings me back to my opening remarks, that if you think this is problematic, it isn't enough to say, well, we don't let it happen here, and what happens over there, that's not our problem, because what happens over there is a very direct result of choices that you've made about what should happen over here, and if you think you got it right for over here, then why would you encourage your nationals to leave, go somewhere else, exploit someone else, and come back with the product of exploitation, and then you provide them with the right papers, and then just hope that they'll all go on their merry way and have a happy life. Thank you very much.